Hi, I'm Rachel, and this is my AM reading video for the holiday weekend of June 2023, because that's honestly the only thing I can say <laughs> about when I'm getting this video out there. <laughs> so uh, in the U.S. Uh, in June, we have um, officially, uh, in a federal way, started commemorating Juneteenth, which broadly speaking is about the end of slavery. I'll leave uh, more information uh, about its specifics down below. And I put off doing this video for a while because I was trying to make some headway in reading, uh, and I also had some other things going on. I got some writing out to my beta reading group that I felt good about, that sort of thing. But uh, now we're out of time, and I want to keep going with my schedule here, and I've made a little bit of a dent. I, I certainly have things to talk about in this video, so I guess I should get to that. <laughs> As always with these AM reading videos, I'm going to start with a short story in a collection, and I am currently reading from this collection. Uh, this is uh, Oi Caramba, an anthology of Jewish stories from Latin America, edited by Elan Stavins. And the story I read this week is called Papa's Friends by Elisa Lerner. It's a story which uh, a young girl in the 50s chronicles um, a bunch of her father's friends who were all Jewish immigrants from uh, you, from Ashkenazi, uh, you know, Russian Empire lands living now in um, Venezuela is where the author uh, was from. Uh, and uh, it, it didn't do that much for me. It's not much of a story. It's more like, you know, a series of vignettes about these people. So I don't know. This is just one of those things from the weekend we're starting out with of something that Eh, I just feel a little bit eh about, but uh, what can you do when it comes to short stories? It's kind of hit or miss sometimes, especially in anthologies, I suppose, with different writers. So, okay. The first book I finished this week is Swimming with Ghosts by Michelle Brofman, which now has come out last Tuesday. Uh, I started it before, in fact, I finished it also <laughs> before last Tuesday. I was graciously given this title uh, by the publisher, uh, because I featured it on one of my Mock Reads videos about uh, contemporary fiction I wanted to get to, and this is definitely more upmarket women's fiction than uh, my usual sometimes, uh, but uh, Michelle Brofman is a local writer, and I've read her other stuff, and I enjoyed this book as well. I don't think it's my favorite of her work, uh, but uh, it, was, it was interesting. It was good. It had that summer feel because it takes place around a pool community. Uh, and in general, you know, it talked about, you know, character stuff uh, without getting too dark and deep and depressing or anything like that. It is, you know, women's up market. Uh, so anyway, we're following these two families in a fictional Northern Virginia suburb. Uh, one of uh, particularly two best friends, uh, Jillian and uh, Christy, who uh, they call themselves Krillian. Uh, this takes place in 2012 when there was a major heat wave uh, and a major storm uh, that, or set of storms that went through uh, the DC area. And these two uh, friends uh, are major players in this pool community. Jillian's father was sort of a big man on campus back in the day, and uh, Jillian is uh, taking over sort of the events planning of the pool now, and uh, is doing her best to sort of like live a social media savvy life where she kind of ignores anything bad that's happening. She has bad stuff in her past, and her father was not quite the stand-up guy that she wants to pretend he is, and now in the present, her husband recently lost his job, uh, and uh, is having a bit of a midlife crisis where he's decided he wants to coach the kids in the swim team rather than, you know, look for a new one as they continue to go into debt. <laughs> uh, and uh, then finally, her best friend Christy kind of starts uh, antagonizing her and treating her the way that she treats other women, because Christy's backstory is she felt unloved and unwanted by her mother, and that uh, manifests in doing a lot of uh, the uh, competition with other women and... Uh, being um, addicted, a love addict, I think is uh, what she uh, seeks uh, counseling for, like, you know, goes to help, help groups for, where, um, you know, she's just has this uh, past uh, trauma that whenever she feels like she was unwanted, uh, she starts, uh, you know, seeking inappropriate attentions from men, that sort of thing, and uh, 
being competitive with women. Um, and anyway, she sort of carries the major part of the novel, which is that she finds out that uh, Jillian is in fact her half-sister and uh, Jillian's father had, you know, a baby with her mom. Uh, and so she was the unwanted and un, you know, documented in a way child. And so the competition part comes out. And so it's about tensions in this relationship uh, during this uh, heated, literally, summer. Uh, and we follow these three POVs and uh, one of their children. Uh, and, you know, it's a kind of a story about people making messes for themselves. It also talks about some parts of modern culture or things that are going to become even more modern culture, I think, when it comes to social media addiction, which is really something that interested me. And the sorts of uh, things that, uh, you know, um, people approaching middle age do to try to <laughs> seem relevant in their lives. I thought those were some interesting side plots uh, or, or main plots even about their characterization. Uh, so anyway, probably the only thing I didn't report on much uh, in the last damn reading video is the ending, and I think uh, the ending turned out okay and uh, probably uh, not too surprising for a woman's upmarket uh, story. I'll leave it there, although I do feel like, you know, you have to tie up the main plot, but there were some of those secondary plots, like, you know, the debt situation, that I was like, are we not going to talk about this? You know, I always feel like... Maybe that's like a, one of the negatives of about following too many POVs around is that everybody has a story, but I don't know if everybody always gets tied up or, you know, I don't know. I, I was just a, a little focused elsewhere wondering if uh, we would at least address more of these issues uh, rather than uh, just the main issue at the end. But uh, still, it was, it, it was feel good and uh, thoughtful uh, and uh, summary as in summary, not in summary. <laughs> so uh, I'm glad I got to it. The next book I read and finished this week uh, is also a new 2023 release. This is Cantica by Elizabeth Graver, which I listened to on audiobook. And anyway, I just talked about this in one of my most recent videos, uh, Mock Reads videos about historical fiction uh, this year that interested me. This uh, is a bit of a sprawling epic in a way about um, a Sephardic family that is a Jewish family uh, with some roots in Spain. Uh, but we pick up the story uh, at the beginning of the 20th century when the family uh, is settled in, in Istanbul because, or, you know, Constantinople at the time, because actually all of the Jews uh, were kicked out of Spain in 1492. Uh, and many of them in those Middle Ages found refuge uh, in the Ottoman Empire. Uh, but by the 20th century, things are starting to fray. The Ottoman Empire is uh, starting to fray. And nationalism in Turkey and other places is starting to rise. And Jews are kind of being seen as outsiders again. Uh, and so we're following the Cohen family, which is actually based on um, the author's real-life family. She wrote a essay about it in uh, the Jewish Book Council, I'll link down below, where, you know, you can see that she didn't even change uh, many names, it seems like, when it came down to things. Uh, but anyway, the Cohen family that we're following, uh, including the main character who is based off of the author's grandmother, they have to leave Turkey in part because of um, financial difficulties. You know, they start the book on top of the world that, you know, or, you know, that they're really well off and, you know, they've been in Turkey for a long time by then. But uh, they have to leave uh, in far less financially stable circumstances. And in fact, they find a position in Spain and uh, go back to that country with mixed uh, feelings uh, because Spain is still not a very open place for Jews. They are mostly uh, living in secret, although uh, the patriarch of the family's job does revolve around uh, maintaining an old synagogue. Uh, and from there, you know, the story, you know, it's a really short story, so uh, I feel like, uh, you know, this, the span of it maybe is a little too much for the length of the story, but, you know, it ends in 1950, and we're largely following Rebecca through that time. Like, she's a teenager when the family moves to Spain, and she ultimately gets a job as a seamstress only by taking on a Catholic name, but she does make a living for herself. She gets involved in a sad marriage that ends early, uh, and then ultimately by the 1930s, as Europe is starting to heat up for World War II, 
their family is trying to locate to America and one of the daughters is already in America and they find a way for Rebecca and her two sons to move to America uh, to marry a widower who's uh, related to the family. Uh, and they make a blended family with the widower and his uh, daughter, who actually has some uh, physical and mental disabilities. Um, and uh, they move to the U.S. and start a new life there and, uh, you know, try unsuccessfully to get the rest of the family uh, out of Spain. Um, or at least uh, Rebecca's parents out of Spain. But, you know, then by then we're following Rebecca and her children in the U.S. And it's another novel that jumps from POV to POV. Uh, and I, I liked it. I, I really liked it, although I feel like there was that unevenness as we're jumping around. We start with Rebecca's the most uh, constant POV, but also in the beginning of the novel, her parents are POVs, and by the end, it's her and her stepdaughter and one of her sons who are the POV characters. And I felt like in the beginning, I, I think it took me a little while to warm up to it. Some of the writing was a little passive, and I could probably be more forgiving of that by the end when I was invested. And I just feel like, um, I don't know, the beginning of the novel kind of uh, interested me less, I suppose. Uh, there were some really fascinating things from the patriarch's point of view about his um, about his pride and his ethnicity in this complicated situation that uh, they uh, he was living in Turkey after you know generations of being expelled from Spain and then going back to Spain uh, and uh, just uh, the layers of history of what that means for Sephardic Jewry. And at the same time, uh, and this is based on uh, real life, uh, the family was uh, part of this uh, nationalistic 13-minute uh, video where this uh, Spanish nationalist uh, went to uh, Jews, to Sephardic Jews, to try to say, oh, you're back in Spain and you're part of our culture. And, you know, that's something uh, they... Uh, apparently were was a they were philo-semitic in that way for a little while until Spain became more fascist uh, and so I felt like that rumination stuff uh, and what it meant for the patriarch who uh, whose uh, fortunes changed so heavily that was interesting but then I felt like the other parts that maybe were even more interesting all happened in America particularly around the relationship between Rebecca and her stepdaughter uh, and how they were sort of vying for a place where they were both out of place in America because Rebecca was an immigrant and uh, Luna because of her physical and mental deficiencies and even though Rebecca actually was instrumental in um, actually helping Luna during a time in the 30s and 40s when there wasn't a lot of help for uh, people with those uh, disabilities. So I thought that was that could have been a fascinating story to be fleshed out in and of itself. So it was a little uneven, this novel, but ultimately I uh, got a lot out of it. I really liked it. And uh, the next novel I finished this month was Hooventude by Vanessa Blakesley. This is a novel that had been on my Goodreads TBR for so long that it got to the top of the list, and then I make a resolution every year then to, you know, read those books at the top of my Goodreads TBR. So this is the story of um, a uh, Jewish slash uh, Colombian uh, teenager, really much more Colombian technically in terms of her upbringing. Uh, her uh, father is this um, well-to-do sugarcane farmer in Colombia and her mother uh, had an affair with him uh, when he was living in the U.S. Uh, and she uh, was this uh, Jewish girl from Miami who followed him to Colombia for a little while, but uh, just uh, was uh, so out of sorts with the culture change that she ultimately left. And there's also some issues with the father and that uh, he has a questionable shady past, uh, as I guess a lot of uh, people do who uh, make quick money in a way. He uh, was part of um, the cartel scene and the drug scene and now is this uh, well-to-do uh, farmer uh, in this gated uh, community setting where, you know, he has a lot of uh, privilege and power and uh, his young daughter Mercedes grows up uh, relatively um, blinded uh, in a lot of ways to uh, the problems uh, in Colombia with this novel uh, when she's a teenager taking place at the end of the 20th century. Uh, so she doesn't know much about uh, the strife, about the guerrilla groups, and about the paramilitaries, and about the drug trade 
until uh, by chance she meets um, this radical peace activist, Manuel, and uh, starts this torrid love affair with him. Uh, he just really falls hard for him and learns a lot more about her father's uh, flaws and also just in general what her country uh, is up against. Uh, the Just this uh, push and pull uh, between uh, these groups and the people who are crushed underneath, including people on her father's land who are refugees from villages. Uh, and of course the situation between Manuel and the father is tense as well. They're often on have very different views about uh, how to go about uh, you know making Colombia you know better or a good place to be uh, and also the father wants to use his connections to uh, get Mercedes out of the country uh, where you know there's so many kidnappings and such taking place to go to boarding school in America uh, and she doesn't want to go because she's in love with this guy and wants to start a life with him so most of the book is uh, Mercedes uh, living through this uh, heady experience of uh, romance and uh, sort of a building's roman of knowledge about like the world around her. Finally, tragedy strikes, uh, and then Mercedes uh, feels certain or is led to believe that her father is involved uh, in the tragedy, and uh, she. Uh, does go away to America, but she, she sneaks off uh, under some false pretenses, ends up living with her maternal grandparents. Uh, her father can't follow because uh, he would be arrested if he came back to the U.S. Uh, and so uh, the second part of the novel then is much shorter, like, a, and it takes on this feel like really of Mercedes looking back in the past. I feel like there's a lot more asides where you know that she's writing about this experience from the past. And it's also quite obvious throughout this whole thing that the thorough line through the novel is that she had this uh, uh, huge experience as a teenager that impacted the rest of her life. And it's something that she's struggling with and dealing with as she's trying to live the rest of her life. She makes some inroads with her mother's family, uh, not as much as she would hope. Uh, her mother ends up living in Israel, so there, there is this interesting chapter where she's on a birthright trip and there she uh, is experiencing things through uh, the similarities between um, Israeli culture and Colombian culture, and she uh, gets involved with a soldier there, Asaf, and uh, it's the first person she tries to actually tell her story to and he rebuffs her so that you know obviously is psychologically something that's hindering to her in the future because as she starts to you know have more relationships growing into her 20s uh, she has trouble trusting people and being honest with them and uh you know moving past her past which actually uh destroys the other big relationship uh, that happens uh, in this book with her uh, one-time fiancé Jeremy. So, yeah, the, the second part of the book, uh, you know, it's, it's much more rushed, uh, and I guess I have mixed feelings about that, although really the point of the book is for dealing with this aftermath, so it, it's, it's important in a way for the story of this teenage uh, love affair and uh, political awakening to be uh, the center of it. Uh, and ultimately, uh, things do uh, wrap up in a way, not not in a neat, tidy way, but uh, she does have to uh, go back uh, to that part of her past and try to come to terms with some things and realize that some things weren't as she thought they were uh, and uh, have a bit of a reckoning with her own life. And, and and I thought it was powerful and nuanced for a premise that could seem pretty melodramatic on its uh, on its surface. I really uh, was impressed, I think, uh, with the ruminations in this novel and the character study in this novel. And so far it might be my favorite uh, read of the month. We'll see what the rest of the month brings, but uh, this definitely uh, is a highlight of this Am Reading video. Next, this was my major reading of the weekend. I'm uh, almost through with this by now, finally. We are a uh, reading of Noble Origins by Sh Sahara Khalifa for um, my uh, Israel book club uh, that my synagogue puts on uh, every uh, year. Uh, so this is a Palestinian novel, um, about, um, so showing a different perspective uh, of uh, an Israel book club, certainly. Uh, and it broadly follows a family uh, in the early 20th century, a Palestinian family. It also just uh, goes 
it basically it goes into divides between Jews and Muslims and also how the British are involved by this point. Uh, and it's not speaking to me much. I feel like uh, the writing, again, is way too passive, like it, it's reportage rather than actually uh, writing out the scenes as they happen. Uh, not entirely, but uh, there is a lot of sort of uh, skimming over the action and reporting on it. A lot of uh, names of people that I just am not caring a, a lot about uh, moment to moment. I feel like the scope is really broad. There's a lot of footnotes where she's obviously uh, trying to uh, allude to uh, real philosophical arguments uh, that uh, people were making along the way as uh, Jews and Muslims and the British clashed, but that to me is not a fiction novel that uh, with a story that uh, works for me because it's not, you know, a, close enough to the human uh, characters uh, and it's more of a treatise. So, so far I feel like this isn't really working for me, uh, although I probably will get more out of it during the book club meeting coming up later on, so uh, I will report back. And finally, next on the docket, I have this book. This is Beneath a Scarlet Sky by Mark Sullivan, which I chose in my latest page 112 tag video I'll link down below. It's a monthly TBR game I play, trying to get books off of my physical shelves, and this one has been on at least for a few years. My parents gave it to me because it's a sprawling historical fiction novel that they liked and I think they thought I'd like. There's Jewish Holocaust themes in it. It also takes place in Italy, uh, where my family is from. Uh, and it's a chunkster, and I'm a bit worried because I do have more books on my docket I hope to get to later this month, including another kind of chunkster. But uh, I'm hoping it'll be propulsive. Uh, although it's also may, might be depressing <laughs> as well, but it could also be d propulsive and fun to read, especially uh, after the last book I talked about. It would be nice uh, to get into something a little more dynamic again, so we'll see how it goes. So that about covers it for me now. Uh, my big uh, long weekend is over. It's back to the doldrums of the work week, uh, but uh, one thing I hope to squeeze in around all of my uh, reading and writing and work related stuff is um, another video, uh, particularly my Would You Read It Challenge video. It's another video I do monthly and I particularly uh, utilize the booktube prize for these videos. Uh, the point of the video is to read the first couple of paragraphs of a book, so I'm going to look at a booktube prize ballot of yesteryear and uh, look at that and discuss the merits of those books, because uh, the booktube prize is uh, currently going on, the semifinals are currently going on, and I'm not a part of it, and I miss it, so it'll be fun to do something in that realm again, so stay tuned. I hope all of you who had a long weekend had a productive one or a fun one, and everyone's enjoying what they are reading right now. Thanks so much for watching everyone, and I'll see you next time.